Hello and welcome to the Gospel Project Sunday School lesson for Sunday, December 20th. Um, I'm going to open us with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we have to share together. We pray that you will use the Holy Spirit to reach into our hearts, Lord, and help us to learn something new and something refreshing for this Christmas season and the new year. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's lesson is the Christmas session in our books, but it's not the, um, as we talked about in our in-person class, it's not the typical nativity scene lesson. So as we get ready to start this, we're looking at the fact that our writers want, want the scripture to grab our heart and for us to be able to see his purpose. In the in their introduction, it talks about Paul Harvey, and, and some of us remember Paul Harvey and the rest of the story. Page three. Uh, but Paul Harvey told the story about a man who, uh, a good man, a kind man, uh, evidently went to church, did all those things, but he chose to stay home on Christmas Eve. He just couldn't understand um, God coming to earth. And because he couldn't understand it and, and, and just could not wrap his mind about it, he thought it was impossible, but he sent, his, he sent his family to church. And as he was sitting in the quiet, he heard uh, a thud against the window. And after investigating, he found a flock of birds. Well, they were trying to get out of the cold and one of them had flown into his window. And he took pity on them and he began to think of ways that he could lead them into the barn, into the warmth it, it, somewhere. And he tried several ways, but of course, you know, if you think about it, birds are not going to be herded into something. Um, they were, they scattered and they were frightened by what he was doing. And then recognizing the bird's fear, he thought to himself and, and the, that's a quote, if only I could be a bird and speak their language. I could show them the way to the safe, warm barn, but I would have to become one of them so they could see, hear, and understand. Then the bells of the church began to ring, and at that moment, a new sense of understanding dawned on the man. Now, as I was originally studying and going Christmas session, we're going to talk about the nativity. We're going to talk about Mary and Joseph and that first night. And instead, what we're, we're greeted by is a prime example of how God wanted to be able to speak to us and to take us into the warmth and into the safety. And the only way he could do that was to become human. Just like the man in the story wished that he could become a bird or speak the bird's language. And when he heard those bells of the of the church, it it registered with him what was what was happening. Uh, so the, the writers asked the question: What difference does it make to you that God became one of us? I know that we know the Christmas story. We know about the birth. We, we kind of go through Christ's life that we know about the birth. We know about the being you know, at the temple and, and letting his family go on. We know about his earthly ministry and we know about the cross and we know about the resurrection. We know this, but at what point does it make a difference to us that God chose to become like uh, because the word became flesh, dwelling among us, we have hope today. And because we have that, that hope, as we move deeper into the Christmas season, this year is different. This year may be more about smaller groups. It may be more about immediate family or immediate friends that may be without family. It's it's about that life-saving mission that Christ was on. So as we move into our first set of verses, 
the word came to give life to all who believe. <clears throat> this is John chapter 1, verses 10 through 13. He was in the world, and the world was created through him, and yet the world did not recognize him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of natural descent, or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. So we're looking at the prologue to John's gospel, and it shows us the creative work of God accomplished through the word. And we know that the word is the son of God. So I have to pay attention when I think about this. We have God and the and Christ and the Holy Spirit there at the creation of man. And we have Christ there from the moment that God said, let there be light. Christ's purpose was given. And then we have the fact that the, the sun and the moon and the, and the stars were seated. But the very first created act was to pull light into existence. So I have this image of Christ there at the very beginning, watching everything unfold. And then later in this lesson, we're going to see how as human, he's going kind of backwards. And it's hard to talk about because Christ is God. But Christ is the Son. And as we're, we're looking at this concept, knowing that the Son of God created all things, he was there through all those things, and we actually owe our physical birthday to God. The fact that we were actually born, that we're alive. But at the same time, we owe our spiritual birthday to God because we make the decision that we are going to be, uh, to ask for forgiveness and that we're going to be born again and for us to be able to, to move forward. As we, as we look at this, we're looking at Christ giving us life to those who believe. So once we have that physical birthday, we have our adopted birthday. We have that time that we are taken into his, his family. Um, and if Eric would read our fill in the blank. Adoption into God's family is one of the positive benefits of justification. Not only are we pardoned from the judgment against us through justification, but we also experience a change of identity. We become children of God. Through adoption, our relationship with God, which was once lost through the fall, is now restored, resulting in the benefits of being an heir of God and a co-heir of Christ. Last week, if you remember, we studied that um, Christ is the perfect human. He's not created, but he exists the way that we were originally created to exist. We were created in his image to be perfect people, to live with God and commune with him forever. And then sin marred that. And so Christ's redemption and his example to us is a way that we were created to live and in and were intended to live if sin hadn't entered our life. So while we we appreciate and we greatly value the redemption that Christ offers, we should be like him anyway. And that's all the more reason for us to strive to be like him. And at this point, when we say strive to be like him, some of you internally, you're, you're not listening because you think about how can I be like Christ? How can I be that, that person? And we're not talking about being God, 
but we're talking about that that co-heir with Christ that we that he considers us his family and and part of it's hard to say being equal I don't know if it's just that filter on my mouth. I just don't want to say that we can be equal with Christ. But what we're doing is we're being pardoned from the judge, judgment through that justification. But because of that justification, we have a change of identity. And that change of identity is we become children of God. Okay. That's a pause button. When we're born, we're God's children. Stop. When we're born, we're God's children. But there comes a point that we have to say that we want to be God's child. And it, it's that, that relationship that we have with him, that very vertical relationship that I have a physical birthday and I have a spiritual birthday because I made this decision to give my life to Christ. Does it mean that everything is easy? Does it mean that everything is perfect? Does it mean that everything goes the way I want it to go? No. Does it mean that when my feet hit the floor in the morning, I thank him for who he is in my life and I try to strive through the day to be a good example and to rest with him and to have that feeling of being restored. Um, as we think about some ways that we should respond to that gift, what a gift. Uh, those that may be listening who have adopted children, you, you've given that child something that no one else can. You've given them that family. You've given them the things that they need. Um, and with it come responsibilities. Just like becoming adopted by Christ comes with a set of responsibilities. So I'm going to ask Eric if he'll read the second set. This is also John chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We observed his glory. The glory is the one and only son from the father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him and exclaimed, this was the one of whom I said, the one coming after me ranks ahead of me because he existed before me. Okay, so here we go. We're going to be talking about the Trinity. There's just during this season, there appears to be no way to get around it. From eternity, the second person of the Trinity is the Son of God. The Word came into his re into creation as flesh. And we know that Jesus is the Word. But he didn't come to just speak of the message of God. Or to he didn't come to be a prophet. He actually is the message of God, which is hard for my little brain to wrap around that you have God and Jesus, that second person, the word coming to the earth as flesh, as the message of God and going about life. Uh, in Hebrews, it's described long ago, God spoke to the ancestors by the prophets at different times and in different ways. In these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. God has appointed him heir of all things and made the universe through him. That idea again, that Christ was there when the universe was formed because it was done through him. We We take a moment and we have to think about that Jesus himself shows us what God is like. I struggle with the concept of here's God, here's Jesus, here's this first picture 
of the first the first Christmas, the birth, the baby lying in a manger, and we're meant to see God's love. When we look at a baby, we get that that warm feeling, and you know, if people start doing the googly goos and the and the wanting to pinch cheeks and and just attracted to the child because there's such a such a feeling of love. That night, that in that manger was God in the flesh, letting us know that we would be able to love personally because he loved us so much that he came to be a person. Um, this idea of Jesus is humanity. Some people struggle with it. I mean, and then some people joke about it. Can you imagine being Jesus's brother or sister? Can you imagine? Oh, Jesus didn't do that. But but the idea is, as we look at his humanity, he did that because he loves us so much that he wanted us to be able to relate to him because he could relate to us. To read, please. Humanity. Mm -hmm. In addition to being fully divine, the Bible also affirms that Jesus is fully human. Not only does the Old Testament affirm that the promised one, Messiah, would be a man, but the New Testament also affirms that Jesus' earthly life bore all the marks of being a human. So when we ask, well, how could I be like God or how could I be more like Jesus? His whole life, a lot of his life is outlined in the New Testament. And um, from eyewitness accounts, of how he lived. And most of it boils down to that he loved people and how he treated people. So we can start with that and just even try to emulate him the same way that if we want to learn how to do something, um, we, we find people that already do it, that know how to do it. And we watch them, we listen to them, we learn from them and we mimic what they do to some extent until we become versed enough to do it on our own. So if we just even try to copy Christ's lifestyle, we're on the road to be more like him, which is on the road to be more like God. So we have this idea that the original ten intent of humankind was to bring glory to God. And we know what happened with Adam, and we know how we've been separated from God. And we know that we're tempted to be our own God, little g, and to live for ourselves and not for God's glory. It's easy to get up in the morning and go about your day, and possibly God doesn't cross your mind that day until you need him to cross your mind. You either need him to remind you of things. Christ came as a human and experienced those things like hunger. And he experienced things like thirst or weariness or sorrow. And temptation. And, and then pain. He very much, as God, experienced those things. And I think he did that so he understood what I go through during my day. That he has this concept of what a day in the life of is. I, I don't understand what a life in the day of Jesus is. I know that I can study and I can read and I can be pointed to things but in this case there's just so much about him that I don't understand yet but I have that ability because he's adopted me he's pulled me into his family that every day I can learn a little bit more you know John the Baptist learned the joy of living his purpose why was he here because he was here to prepare people for the coming of the Lord. He was here to prepare the path for the Messiah. 
he could have gotten the big head about that, that he was first and that he was doing this and it was going to be his way, but he didn't. He understood that for Jesus to increase, he had to decrease. He had to say that the one who followed him was greater and should have been first. But because of his his purpose in life and his humbleness, he was able to give us an example of how we can go about our daily life and put Christ first and how we can lead, lead a way for others to come and understand him or at least want to ask questions or to know what's going on. Can you imagine if John the Baptist had sold timeshare condos at the Dead Sea Resort? Okay, now humor. That that would have been different. This is John chapter 1, verses 16 through 18. Indeed, we have all received grace upon grace from his fullness. For the law is given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Christ. No one has ever seen God, the one and only Son, who is himself God, and is at the Father's side, has revealed him. I, I'm going to step in the dangerous ground like I do every week. There's always some quicksand. And my quicksand this week, thank you, is I don't like just handing someone a New Testament. It's a personal belief that they need to, you need the ability to have the old and the new. Um, without the old, the new references things that you would never understand. Without the concept of why Christ had to go through the things because it was prophecy, without having that prop access to that prophecy, you don't you don't get the full picture. It's just a story. But we know that the Hebrews were given through Moses the law. The law was a burden. The law was protection. The law came, it governed every aspect of their life, which meant it was like a carpenter's level. It, it would show where there were uneven things, or the, the bubbles off, but it doesn't say how to fix it. It just says that the bubble is, that something's unbalanced. Just like an x-ray shows a break, but it doesn't say how to fix the break. It just points out that there is a break. So it di diagnoses the problem, but it doesn't solve it. The law was paving the way, though, for the grace that has come in Jesus. Jesus is going to provide grace and truth for us. So we need to still be able to recognize those things in the Old Testament so that our, our level works. But now Christ can come behind us and reach in and straighten those areas. He doesn't just diagnose them. He actually gives us that lift that we need. The law can't provide salvation. It doesn't matter how well I follow the law. It does not provide salvation. In our class this morning, it was a show of hands. Have you ever sped? Okay. We know that that's against the law. We know that sometimes the road is clear and our foot is heavy. Sometimes it's our foot is heavy because the traffic around us is going to romp over us if we don't do what we can do to keep up. But we know that we're breaking the law. We know that salvation, though, is there, that through Christ's life and his death and his resurrection and his sending of the Holy Spirit, that he is there, that he brings us grace and he brings us truth. And while we see the Old Testament as laws and prohibitions, 
we see the sacrifices in it that point directly to Jesus. And then we get to the point of it's the Christmas story. This is supposed to be about wise men, Mary, Joseph, and sheep, and, and shepherds, and, and, and things that couldn't have happened in one night. But what we have is that the Christmas story points to the cross. And the Christmas story points to the fact that Jesus took my place. It doesn't matter about all the million other people in the world, billions of people in the world throughout time. Christ was born that night so that he could live his life and offer a way and then would die on that cross, whether it was just for me or just for you. It's, it's hard to think of something that happened in the past was for me in the future. But he provided that, that salvation, that path, that faith, that idea that we surrender our own, end, our own efforts. And when we surrender our own efforts, we're able to accept the gift of God's riches. Those riches came at an expense, and that was Christ's life. But we know that his sacrifice was scheduled. I hate to say it that way, but scheduled that he was born and we have those things that we see through his life and then we see the fulfillment of those prophecies. So as we go into this season and we're kind of already in the season, by the time we, we watch this, we'll be a, a, a work week away from, from Christmas. And the question would be for me, how did that night over 2,000 years ago change me? Is it just the, the warm fuzziness of the holidays? Is it just the, well, it's his birthday and we are, we're going to celebrate? Or do I have that moment that I can actually look at that idea of adoption? That idea that apart from Christ, we're, we're orphans. We're separated from God. But because he, he accepts us and he loves us, he's able to, uh, we're able to be adopted and we're able to one day be reunite, reunited with God. So as, we, as you go through your week, Take a moment and stop. C.S. Lewis said, The pure light walks the earth. The darkness received into the heart of de deity is there swallowed up. Where, except an uncreated light, can the darkness be drowned? Everything we do in our life points back to Christ once we've been adopted. So I hope that this lesson today has had, has maybe sparked you to go look something up or has made you think about how Christ came as flesh and, and as the word. But we hope that you have a Merry Christmas and that you use good sense uh, in this holiday season. And we just ask that as Eric closes us, that you're comforted by the fact that if you haven't been adopted by Christ yet, that he's waiting for you to make that decision. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this lesson today. We thank you for your word that you've given us to study and to guide us. We thank you for the spirit, Lord. And we thank you for Jesus and his life and his example to us. We pray, Lord, that during this season we'll reflect on his birth and life and death and resurrection so that we may draw closer to you, be an example, Lord, and be used of you. We pray, Lord, for those who are sick. We pray, Lord, for those who will be alone during this season, that um, you'll comfort them, that you'll use your people, Lord, to support them all in any way that we can. 
We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.